but she let me in and there was a gentleman sitting in the corner who she introduced as a friend of hers but it was very clear to me that that was her brother that was my father tell us then about the point you'd got to in your life um when you realized you just wanted to know a little bit more about how it all began for you okay so in my late teens and very early 20s i wasn't particularly interested in babies um, i was busy with other things and then my sister had her first child and shortly after my brothers had both of their first and as an auntie that changed everything i um, had feelings for these children that I had never experienced before and made me feel very maternal and suddenly realised that actually babies were as wonderful as everybody said. Um, and people were beginning to say, oh, he looks like you or she looks like you or oh, I remember when you cut your first tooth. And I realised that nobody would be able to give me any of those answers or um, any of those milestones for me unless I could find out some more about my first beginnings. Um, I was nearly two and a half when I was adopted, so there was a lot of firsts that had been missed by the time I got to my adoptive parents. So that was what took me off on the on the trek to begin with, was simply just to find out some more and see where you fit in to a, to a family in terms of looks and, and genetics. And did you tell anybody in your adoptive family about what you were doing? No, I didn't. I knew that my mum... It was one of her great fears that um, both myself and my sister, who was also adopted from different circumstances, um, might want to do that at some point. And she was always very worried that she might lose us as a result of that. Um, ironic, given the circumstances, when I thought perhaps I would lose them the other way around. So talk us through what you then did. And you did all of this alone then, totally, yes. totally alone. Yes, and in those days there was no counselling or training or anything like that. You know, these sorts of things, you just picked up yourself and, and ran with it. So I went to my local social services first of all. And this is, um, sorry, to, to, Teresa, we probably should know exactly when this was, the 1980s? Yes. Yeah, yeah. OK, got the 80s, yeah. yeah, carry on. Yeah. Um, when we were not anywhere near as aware about how people might feel or how things impact people as we are today, thank goodness, um, so my local social services um, established that I came under the care of Islington Social Services in those days and what was the London County Council. Um, and they were able for to set up for me a meeting for me to go in and view my notes at Islington. Um, so I was given a date and a time and an address and that's what I did. I turned up supposing that I was going to read some very interesting and things about myself and my family, um, only to find that it was really quite different. So can you just tell us what exactly it said in the notes? So in the notes, at the top, it started off that my um, mother was only 16, which didn't surprise me. Um, in those days, a lot of very young mothers were, you know, leaned on to get their children adopted or it was circumstances they couldn't bring them up on their own. But as I read down further, it listed the father who was listed as her brother, who was only 14 at the time. So you're sitting in a room on your own in a council building, reading through all of this. Uh, I mean, it must be a moment that you have relived many times. Uh, I, I almost don't want to ask you to relive it again for us, but that's exactly what yeah. I'm doing. What did you feel? To begin with, I, I had to go back and read it again because I thought I must have made a mistake. And then I just began to feel really quite sick, to be honest. Um, I have been brought up in a Catholic family, gone to Catholic schools and people didn't even have sex before marriage. They certainly, incest was an absolute, a real, you know, it was off the scale in terms of what was acceptable. Um, and so to start with, I just kept reading and rereading, shock, revulsion, and then utter shame. And the thought then that I could never ever tell my parents about this. In fact, I wasn't sure I could tell anybody about this because people would think differently of me if they knew where I had come from, was what I thought. So in my head, this was just the end of everything as I knew it. Mm. And 
Sorry, go on. Well, I was just going to ask you, I mean, before handing that folder to you, the 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 people in the council offices would have read it too. They would have known what was in that folder, wouldn't they? You would you would have thought so. And to this day, I still don't know what was going through their heads or whether they did read it. Maybe they didn't. Maybe they just pulled it out and I left it. They made it very clear to me that I couldn't take anything away. So if I wanted to make any notes, they had given me a, a notepad and a pen. But I don't know if they had read it. I don't know if they'd read it and not known what to do with it. Or as I say, it was such different days, um, you know, that sort of 40 years ago, that people didn't think, I don't think, about the impact of, of information like that. Nowadays, you would be getting counselling beforehand. Somebody would have checked it all out beforehand. You would probably have a mediator. But in those days, it was just, I think it was not, I don't think it had been that long when people could, A, that they could access their notes once they were 18, and B, that you could be put on the register that was about people looking either for parents or parents looking for children mm. um, who'd gone through the adoption services. I don't think that had been in place for very long. And so perhaps, you know, I have to err on the side that perhaps ignorance was, was what did it rather than just couldn't be bothered. So you put the papers back in the file and handed it back in and summoned your dignity and, and walked out, I suppose. I took my scraps of paper with me, yes. Yeah. yeah. And who did you tell? I didn't. I walked around for ages, um, just feeling more and more sick and more and more shamed by what I'd read until finally I took myself home and I didn't tell anybody for 20 years. It was just something I Gosh. knew that I could not explain to anyone. I, I, was, I was revolted at me. So what would other people think if I thought that of myself? I couldn't take the risk. And I thought that people would turn their backs on me. I thought my parents would be absolutely devastated. And they would just say, well, sorry, you know, that isn't what we bought mm. into. So off you go. I think, I think, sorry, go on. No, I was just going to say, I mean, apart from the in incredible uh, emotional overload and damage of all of that, there is that sudden knowledge as well, isn't there, that actually for you to have children of your own would become a more complicated and possibly dangerous thing to do. Absolutely. That was the thing that changed overnight for me as a result of it because I, through my own ignorance and lack of knowledge and because I didn't discuss it with anybody, I had the impression that if I had children, I ran the risk of having children with either very severe mental or physical disabilities. And that would be as a result of my parentage, which I could not inflict on another person, knowing how I was feeling at that point. And so I made the decision that I could never have children. Were you in a relationship at the time? I was, yes. And I subsequently ended that because if I was going to have to explain why I couldn't have children, then I would have to explain the whole thing. And so, and I wasn't prepared to do that at all. I felt nobody should ever know this. And so I broke it off for other reasons. So, Teresa, you break up with your then partner. And um, how long after this did your birth mother make it known that she wanted to meet you? Very soon after, actually. I had put my name on the register when I had visited the local social services. And within a few months, they had contacted me again to say that her name had come up and she was interested in meeting me if I was still interested in meeting her. Um, and I obviously didn't say anything about what I already knew, but said, yes, I most certainly did want to meet, to meet her. And they came back to me with a, a date and a time and an address in London to go to. And you went? I went and a very odd start to it all. She opened the door and there was no um, lovely, happy, fluffy ending. She was very cold. I had not realised until I got there just how angry I was about all of it. Um, I'd had to give up having children. I'd had to change everything that I was thinking about my life. I'd given up relationships. And at that point in my head, clearly I blamed her for that. And so I wasn't in the best frame of mind 
to um, go into such a meeting and probably should never have done it like that. But she let me in and there was a gentleman sitting in the corner who she introduced as a friend of hers. But it was very clear to me that that was her brother. That was my father. Everybody in the room, we all looked alike. Um, and he was more than casually interested. He never took his eyes off me the whole time I was there. And it was quite, it's very hard to describe. If you've always been with your genetic family, it's very hard to describe when you first see somebody that actually looks like you. And so that part of the meeting was actually quite positive in that I saw somebody that looked like me and I looked like them and all the things I'd heard about my siblings and their children, I could see was um, visible in front of me. But I just launched off into a tirade of questions and blaming and really getting quite upset and not really giving her a chance to speak. And it wasn't long before she calmed it all down and said, look, you've obviously not in the best frame of mind. This isn't going anywhere. Why don't you go away, write down all the questions you've got and let's meet again and then we can try and answer them for you and do this in a, in a much calmer way. And did that ever happen? No, because I accepted that at face value, realising myself that I wasn't doing it the right way and wasn't getting any of the answers that I wanted. And so I accepted the phone number and went off and over the course of the next few days thought, yes, actually, that's a really good idea. I sat down and wrote out the questions I wanted to get answers for. And then a couple of weeks later, rang the number to reconvene the meeting, only to find that the number was unobtainable. Gosh. Tried through the operator. No, the number was disconnected. I went back to the place where we'd met. There was nobody there. Nobody either side could tell me anything. Um, didn't know the people that had lived there, knew nothing about them. And so now I've got all these half answered questions, which just made the whole situation even worse for me. And still, so, Teresa, you're on your own. Nobody else knows about this. No, no, absolutely not. And now even more so because I've messed up this meeting by being so angry and so upset. And so not only have I got the first secret, now I can't tell anybody why I couldn't even find out anymore. Mm. So I didn't, I buried it. I'm sure lots of our listeners this afternoon, Therese would want both Jane and I to say, that wasn't your fault. I mean, you know, you had every right to be angry. There were three people in that room who needed to have a very open conversation. You are the youngest and most vulnerable one in that mm. room. So... Uh, you know, I'm, it, it, it's it's heartbreaking, actually, to think of just how vulnerable you must have been at that time. Other people who have since known your story, can they tell you a bit more about how all of that changed you to them? Or do they think that you managed to keep it completely and utterly hidden away from them too? You know, your your adoptive family and your friends... I was very good at it. Nobody knew and nobody suspected. And they certainly were as surprised as me when I did finally tell anyone. But no, as far as they were concerned, I became the best auntie. And I loved my nieces and nephews and had a really good time with them growing up and still have a good relationship. So everybody just thought I was a great auntie. And I just used to fob off questions about, you know, surely you want children, you want to get married? Yes, yes, but I've never met the right one. And, you know, and I was able to just keep skirting around it. And people accepted that. In the end, you did decide to tell one friend um, who I think had worked as a counsellor. Is that right? Yes, yes. And I'm not even sure why that happened. I certainly hadn't planned to say anything that day. Um, we were on quite a long car journey together. And we were just generally chatting about childhood and that sort of thing. And... I think that it all, if you've ever, people who've kept secrets will probably be able to tell you that you put little compartments in your head and you can put everything into little boxes. And I was very good at keeping all of that separate. And I've had quite a lot of health problems over the years and I'd managed to box all that off as well. I was not able to take up the career I wanted in sport for the same reason. 
And just for some reason, my boxes just started opening and it just all came out in a great long flood of, of um, disclosure. And the first thing that he said to me was why on earth would you think that people would not love you the same as they love you already? Why would you think that what happened to you and in the start of your life had anything to do with the person that you are today? You silly, silly woman, you know? And he was like, just do not even give that a thought. People want you, people love you for you, not for anything else. And to think that you've been carrying that around and never told anybody is just horrible. Mm. And so that was the first person I told. So that made a big difference. Um, to begin with, I wasn't sure that I believed him and I thought perhaps he was just saying it. But as time went on, I realized that actually he was probably right. And, and what, did, sh- what did your adoptive family say when you told them? So I told one sibling and then I told my other siblings and they were exactly the same. Um, Why on earth would you think we would think anything differently of you? It it has absolutely no bearing on you as a person or our relationship with you as as a sibling. And when I told my parents, they were really very distressed because they thought that the thought of me carrying that around and not being able to tell them and not being able to talk to them about it when it wouldn't change anything between us, um, quite distressed them to think that one of their children had lived like this for, you know, 20 odd years and had not felt able to say anything. And just were completely reassuring and, you know, just wished that they'd known and that, or that they'd even been told, you see, they'd know nothing about my background either. I was going to ask that actually. So they, they did not know your adoptive parents? No. And in those days, I don't think people did disclose very much, even if they knew it. I think you just, you know, not like today where you know everything about the child and everything about the child's parents and all the genetics and physical, mental challenges that they may have had. All that gets passed on, but not then. Well, we have um, someone listening um, who says they're a social worker, Teresa, and they say th- see things like this on a daily basis. And they just want you to know that they think you're amazing for telling your story and being so strong uh, for doing all this on your own. And I, and I think that won't be a lone voice, that person who, who's filled with admiration for you, Teresa, because uh, it was just a very, very lonely experience for you. And although things do, people do talk about so much more now, mm. Incest, although it clearly happens, is still a taboo. Are there, I, I think so. Yes, mm. I, think, I think you're doing your very best, by the way, to change that. But there's no doubt that people are very, very ill at ease about this subject, mm. aren't they? Very much so. And I think that it's the one thing I've learned is that, of course, no matter what happened at your conception, as it were, that should not have a bearing on you in the rest of your life. No. Mm. But I think because it is such a taboo subject, people go away with the ignorance that I went away with you know you're going to have monsters if you have children and you know that sort of thing that was is the way that when people don't talk openly about things things get misconstrued things get misrepresented and if I can stop one person making the lifestyle choice I made wrongly because if I had known then what I know now I would have carried on my life and had children and gone on to have a family um, then then my work is done, as it were, because that's the reason I talk. And not just about this, but I think generally about people carrying shame and not being able to share and talk and, and get some reassurance. Yep. Then, you know, that we're in an age now where we encourage people to talk. So the more they do, the, the, the more knowledge is shared, I think. And Teresa, we don't have very much time left at all, but what is it that you have subsequently been told uh, about your ability to have had healthy children, if that's what you chose to do? That it probably wouldn't have made any difference at all. If there'd been any genetic hereditary diseases in the ordinary way, then possibly that might have been a problem, but that would be no different if my parents had not had it, um, not been related themselves. But the, the chances of me having a child with anything wrong with them would have been very, very slim. Mm. 